Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsena. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, the COVID forecast for the winter. We're just really in the wrong place right now. Ontario alone could see 3,000 cases a day by January without taking Omicron into account. It's very concerning. And inside the secure lab trying to crack Omicron's code. The military's former head of HR now charged with sexual assault. The fact that we're in this situation right now is very significant. The most serious allegations against a senior member. Parental controls are coming to Instagram. I'll notice myself clicking onto it even more. It is kind of that instant gratification. But some call the safety measures disingenuous. And the Canadian-made vaccine showing real promise. We're excited about the results. And it's made from plants. This is The National. Just weeks away from Christmas and COVID-19 is already casting a shadow over the holidays. The Omicron variant is spreading and adding to the risk and inconvenience of travel. But still, the real problem facing Canadians, the Delta variant that never really stopped surging, just moved to new hotspots. This is Canada's average daily new cases over the past six months. From the lulls in the early summer to a wave that appears to fall and now is rising again. Looking at the provincial breakdown, the earlier surge was driven by the West, specifically Alberta, B.C. and Saskatchewan. But now, case rates in those provinces are lower and stable. The pandemic's center of gravity shifting to Quebec and Ontario, responsible for 70% of new cases today and projected to get worse. That's the prediction from Ontario's science advisory table, especially after a period of loosening public health measures and with gatherings moving indoors for the winter. Thomas Daglin now on what that means for hospitals and holiday plans. As COVID cases climb once more, it can feel like Ontario is going round and round again. With about a thousand infections a day now and nearly triple that projected for January, even without Omicron. I feel like we've been here forever and like I felt like it was starting to get better. I'm disappointed in a lot of people not taking the vaccination, okay? I mean, they're affecting everybody else. The latest modeling from Ontario's science advisory table says the province could approach 3,000 daily infections next month. Then again, more public health measures could lead to a much flatter curve. We would already be in the wrong place with Delta, you know, because cases are going up in parts of the province, not everywhere. Ontario is again delaying further reopening with remaining capacity limits staying in place. We are waiting to find out about the transmissibility, the virulence, and the effect of this variant vis-a-vis -vis our vaccines. It's a much different approach than in Quebec, which is also seeing cases rise, but easing restrictions over the holidays, allowing groups of 20 vaccinated people to celebrate together at home. We'll probably see more cases. The issue is to make sure that those cases don't go to hospital. In Ontario, too, the fear is the holidays won't just mean more cases, but more patients in hospital. If we were to have the same pressure on our ICU system as we had in Wave 3, I'm not sure we would be able to accommodate people the way we did. As many as 400 Ontarians sick with COVID are expected to need intensive care in January. So it really just delays the end of the pandemic. And again, all roads lead to the unvaccinated being the root cause of, uh, of this. Experts are again saying everyone eligible should get their shots and older adults their third doses. A way to plug a hole in Ontario's defences that are about to get tested yet again. Okay, so Thomas, do we know what Ontario officials are saying about the impact of Omicron on the modelling? Yeah, the new variant was not taken into account in today's modeling, Andrew, given all the uh, uncertainty around its transmissibility. But Ontario's uh, COVID uh, scientific advisors do say that it is likely that Omicron will make case counts go up even higher than what is in today's uh, modeling. Uh, the provincial government is also pointing to that uncertainty uh, when asked why it hasn't provided an updated roadmap out of this uh, pandemic. I should also say uh, the numbers released today do suggest that the severity of the impact from all those holiday gatherings well it's probably going to be not as bad as it was last year when practically no one was vaccinated andrew right okay good point thomas dagle thank you very much you're welcome now cases of the omicron variant do continue to crop up with a jump reported in bc 
So far, uh, they've all been mild cases or asymptomatic cases. Four additional cases over the weekend brings BC's total to five, three of which were in fully vaccinated people. Manitoba also reported its first Omicron case today. All the new cases linked to international travel. Now, it's still too early to know how dangerous the new variant is, but Vicodopia has spoken to Canadian scientists teasing out the real-world capabilities of Omicron. This is what they see and why they're urging caution. At this secure Toronto lab, they're growing what could be the most contagious strain of the coronavirus yet to study what kind of threat Omicron actually poses. Scientists know the variant has more mutations to the virus's spike than in previous strains. But deciphering what all those adaptations mean is painstaking work. We can't just look at one and say, oh, because of the mutation at 501, we know this is going to happen because it happened with, uh, with Alpha or with, with Delta. So that's why we have to, we have to look at it in, in uh, the, the whole thing in context, which is why we have to do all the, um, uh, all the work in, in high containment labs. Researchers are also studying the growing number of people testing positive for Omicron to answer three critical questions. Whether it's more transmissible, does it lead to more severe illness, and is it more resistant to our immune responses, especially in vaccinated people? We need to see uh, multiple cases. We need to review the charts. We need to compare it to, uh, uh, to patients who, who have the, the other variants to get sort of a, uh, a bit of an idea. That obviously, uh, that takes time. Uh. According to the latest data from South Africa, hospitals reported they saw a rapidly growing number of mostly unvaccinated patients infected by Omicron, suggesting higher transmissibility. But their symptoms were milder compared to previous waves, news that has fueled both hope and skepticism. I take all that with a grain of salt because we've seen anecdotal stuff come out on previous variants and it turns out not to be the case. And at the end of the day, most of the variants seem to present with a pretty similar clinical picture. But we'll see. For now, it's the Delta variant still driving the numbers. Since it took over this summer, more than 3,000 Canadians have died from COVID-19, overwhelmingly unvaccinated. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. And south of the border, as the U.S. moved moves towards 50 million cases, there is growing concern with Omicron. But as Katie Simpson tells us, while all eyes are on the variant, it's Delta that continues to spread, and that is leading to a warning for Canadians. This is make or break time across the service industry. Holiday bookings are being finalized, but with COVID cases surging yet again, Steve Forbes wonders how many of those parties will actually happen in his restaurant. Offices are now tasked with the decision, do we do it, do we not do it? And I think it's like that whole like angel devil, and I think most people want to do it. People want to go out, people want to travel. It's, it's, it's happening. The U.S. is averaging over 100,000 new cases per day, up 28% over the past two weeks. Right now, there are roughly 1,100 daily COVID deaths. If that pace continues, more than 800,000 Americans will have died from COVID before the new year. And while the Omicron variant has been confirmed in 19 states, 99% of all COVID cases in this country are the Delta strain. We have a major Delta surge, and if, if you are not vaccinated, Delta will find you and you will get sick and you may end up in the hospital and you may end up dying. About 64% of Americans over the age of five are fully vaccinated. And the White House says it's encouraged by the uptake of the booster program. There has been uh, an increase in boosting uh, by people over the past week plus, one million people a day, uh, and we're continuing to make sure they're accessible around the country. But the rising cases, especially in some northern states, are so concerning it's prompting a warning in some parts of Canada. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is recommending that all residents avoid non-essential travel to Minnesota, Wisconsin and Michigan because of their high case rates and the public health measures are generally looser than the rules at home. These COVID numbers are expected to get worse through the holiday travel season. But for now, the White House is not calling for restrictions or lockdowns, focusing instead on testing and getting more shots into arms. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Well, COVID is the reason this month's mission by Indigenous and Catholic leaders to the Vatican has been postponed. The health and well-being of our delegates, their families and communities is paramount to us. 
and we will not put anyone in harm's way if we can help it. The trip was announced in June with the hope of securing a papal visit to Canada and an apology for the role the Catholic Church played in the residential school system. It is uh, sad for a number of the delegates who were very much looking forward to this opportunity, but uh, first and foremost uh, are the concerns around COVID and keeping people healthy and safe. The Canadian organizers of the trip are working to reschedule the visit for early next year. Well, now to another shattering blow to the battered image of Canada's armed forces. A vice admiral has been charged with sexual assault and committing indecent acts. So clearly that's a very high rank and those are very serious charges. Not only that, Vice Admiral Hayden, Hayden Edmondson had been in charge of human resources up until this March. That is when CBC's Ashley Burke first shed light on the alleged incident and Edmondson was put on paid leave. Tonight, Ashley begins with the woman whose account led to the charges. I know now 30 years afterwards that it never, it never leaves you. This is how the allegations came to light. Stephanie Vio, a former military member, went public last March. She leveled the most serious allegations yet against a senior leader during the sexual misconduct crisis. I want justice for me, but I also want justice for others. Vio said she was a 19-year-old steward on board a Navy ship in 1991 when her supervisor, Hayden Emmonson, lieutenant commander at the time, started exposing his genitals to her. She yelled at him to stop, she said, but alleges when the ship docked at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, the situation escalated. Vio said Emmonson raped her. I just froze. My body just froze. I, I didn't know what to do. I was terrified. The Canadian Forces National Investigation Service launched an investigation and now has charged Emmonson under the criminal code with sexual assault and indecent acts. In a statement, his lawyer said Vice Admiral Edmondson continues to deny any suggestion of criminal misconduct and looks forward to the opportunity to restore his distinguished reputation for service to our country. Usually cases like this don't even make it to the charge. So the fact that we're in this situation right now is very significant. I do think it's the bravery of this victim um, in bringing forward. And I do think that some media coverage as well that's highlighted um, this, this story and put pressure on um, the defense forces to address this issue. After the story aired, Edmondson was removed as commander in charge of all military personnel and human resources. I think justice coming to senior leaders actually is really empowering for, for victims and especially for victims who've been reluctant to come forward in the past. So Ashley, can you back up a bit here and put this in some perspective for us? Well, Adrian, just yesterday we reported that two other cases of alleged rape were dropped by the same military justice system that has laid charges in this case. Now, those other cases were dropped on the exact same day that the defense minister announced that sexual offenses would be transferred to civilian police to investigate and to civilian courts to prosecute. Edmondson's case is not part of that policy change. Still, it will now be heard in public court. His first appearance is scheduled for late January here in Ottawa. All right, Ashley Burke, thank you for your reporting on this. Thank you. Joe Biden had a rare virtual meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin today, trying to head off any military action in Ukraine with warnings about what would happen if Moscow moves in. Rar Stewart explains. Hello. <laughs> After the pleasantries and once the cameras cut away, the focus shifted to Ukraine and what would happen if Russia invaded. We still do not believe that President Putin has made a decision. What President Biden did today was lay out very clearly the consequences if he chooses to move. U.S. officials wouldn't get into specifics, but they, along with their European allies, have warned of more economic sanctions, which could include cutting Russia out of the SWIFT global banking system and shutting down its Nord Stream 2 pipeline with Germany. Russia denies planning an attack, saying all of its military exercises are routine. Putin says he wants a guarantee that Ukraine will not be allowed to join NATO, something the U.S. says it can't promise. This Russian political analyst doesn't think that war is Russia's endgame, saying it would be too costly and leave Russia too isolated. I think that if uh, Putin really planned uh, anything like that, uh, 
we would be the last uh, to, to know about it. It would be uh, something similar to what happened uh, in Crimea seven years ago. Since then, there's been plenty of talk about a possible invasion in the eastern Ukrainian port city of Mariupol. That's why these women enjoying a glass of cognac are hopeful that the threat subsides. There won't be any kind of attack, this woman says. Russia doesn't need this, and Ukraine even more so. But others say there can be no common ground. This is our territory that Russia is encroaching on, this man said. This is wrong, wrong. The U.S. has committed to send new military equipment to Ukraine and says if there is an invasion, it will bolster NATO's eastern flank. But there's been no talk of sending any troops to Ukraine. Breyer Stewart, CBC News, Moscow. In France, an arrest has reportedly been made in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. He was the critic of the Saudi regime who was murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Many believe at the direction of the Saudi government. Here's Susan Ormiston. The last time Jamal Khashoggi was seen alive entering the Saudi consulate in Turkey. Murdered inside, his dismembered body was never found. Supporters grieved the journalist's grisly death. His employer, The Washington Post, demanded answers. And the UN and US intelligence pointed fingers at the Saudi regime. At a Paris airport Tuesday, a 33-year-old man believed to be Khaled Aid Alotaibi suspected by Turkey, was taken into custody. Khashoggi's former fiancé welcomed the arrest. France should try him or extradite him to a country able and willingly to genuinely investigate and prosecute him, she said. Khashoggi was a journalist, believed to have been murdered for what he wrote about the Saudi government. Saudi Arabia called it a rogue event by agents, eventually convicting eight people unnamed, closing the door on his death. It is not, uh, as they try to pretend, a rogue operation or a mistake. It's a state killing. But a UN report said the Saudi trials were the antithesis of justice. And former UN investigator Agnes Kalamar said the arrested man is one of the group responsible for receiving Khashoggi's body parts and hiding his body. That it could be a breakthrough in the, quote, quest for justice. His arrest comes just days after French President Macron visited with Prince Mohammed bin Salman and could reignite tense diplomatic ties. The Saudi man is in custody in Paris. French police say more investigation is needed to confirm he is the man named as a suspect. Saudi Arabia says the man in custody is a case of mistaken identity and has nothing to do with the Khashoggi killing. It's demanding France release him. Turkey wants the suspect extradited to Istanbul to pursue a criminal case against him. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Well, the Liberal government tabled legislation for the second time this year to get rid of mandatory penalties for a number of tobacco, firearms and drug offences. Their time has come and frankly gone. It's time to move past them and go back to more proactive forms of sentencing. The minister says that applies to low-risk, first-time or non-violent offenders. He says mandatory minimum penalties tend to over-punish marginalized people. The Conservatives, who introduced the sentence guidelines, say the bill puts communities and victims at risk. The Senate has agreed to fast-track a bill that bans the discredited practice of conversion therapy. It also makes it a crime to send a child for conversion therapy abroad. Now, the bill only requires royal assent before becoming law. A CBC News investigation has found that rates of death due to intimate partner violence are higher in rural, remote and northern communities in Canada. The investigation, called Deadly Relationships, is the result of a 16-month effort compiling and analyzing domestic homicides between January of 2015 and June of 2020. Julie Ireton shows us how a long-awaited coroner's inquest in rural eastern Ontario is raising hope for real solutions that might apply to other areas across the country. We lay this rose in the honour of those who have not been named. As organisers planned for their annual December 6th vigil, they heard about yet another death of a woman, presumably at the hands of her partner. 
It happened just weeks ago in this small town. We felt that if we were present here that we could share resources if folks wanted to reach out. It's a community that already sets out 23 roses to represent women lost to intimate partner violence. I think that it is a grieving that will never end. In one horrific incident, Basil Barutsky set out on the country roads of this vast county in September 2015 to kill three women. In 2017, he was sentenced to life in prison. An inquest into those deaths is expected to take place this spring. The local women's centre has hired a lawyer to engage the community in the process, then pass on the findings at the inquest. For me, the hope that that inquest carries with it, that we will be able to make some systemic changes that really, really speak to the realities in rural communities. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Joanne Brooks says the issues that put women at risk haven't changed. We're larger than the province of Prince Edward Island and we have no public transportation. Oftentimes women are tied to farms for their livelihood. It makes it very difficult for them to leave the farms. We also live in the land of a gun culture. Across the country, advocates like Brooks say COVID isolation has increased the risk and a significant lack of affordable housing means it's not easy for a woman to move to leave her abuser. The answers need to come from communities, not big cities, according to this researcher. The things that work in Toronto or Vancouver or Montreal or London, Ontario, you know, are, are not going to work in, in rural communities. And public education and awareness are key, say advocates. This is a very, very, very serious issue and it, it needs a lot of attention and it needs all of us to be part of it to be able to make the change. Julie Ireton, CBC News, Renfrew. And there is help for anyone who needs it. EndingViolenceCanada.org and ShelterSafe.ca both list crisis supports, shelters and sexual assault resources. Well, after months of pressure and just before a congressional grilling, Instagram introduces new safety measures. Probably like a few times a day. Like I'll notice myself clicking onto it even more. They're meant to keep teenagers safe, will they? Plus, hockey parents who will do anything for their kids, including move halfway around the world. His dream is my dream. And later, inside the critical, creative Canadian work to make a brand new type of vaccine to battle the coronavirus. Of course we're excited about the results. We're back in two. Nick Cannon announced the passing of his five-month-old son today on his talk show as he described their final moments together. I holding my son for the last time. <sighs> but it was still, it was a beautiful setting. Cannon broke down telling the story of his final trip to the beach over the weekend with his son, Zen. He's said to have passed from a malignant brain tumor. Social media giant Instagram played defense today, just as it faces new scrutiny of its potential harm to young users. And as Julia Wong shows us, the app has just announced new features to help teens stop overusing it. <laughs> Brianna Roberts spends a lot of time scrolling on her phone, often on Instagram. Probably like a few times a day. Like I'll notice myself clicking onto it even more. It is kind of that instant gratification, you know, checking it, especially when you post. For months, there have been calls for the app to keep young people safer. On Tuesday, Instagram responded. And it's not only important to me that people feel safe on our platform, but that they feel good about the time that they spend on Instagram. The app will stop people from tagging teens they don't follow. It will nudge teens to view other content if they're scrolling for too long on one topic. And it will remind teens to take a break. The moves are meant to ease parental fears. Sparked after former Facebook employee Frances Haugen testified the company, which owns Instagram, puts profits before people. She said internal research suggests the apps contribute to mental health and body image issues. It's just like cigarettes. Teenagers don't have good self-regulation. They say explicitly, I feel bad when I use Instagram and yet I can't stop. The timing of this announcement, just one day before Instagram head Adam Mosseri will be grilled before a U.S. Senate subcommittee. 
One expert argues the measures are only meant to repair credibility and reputation and calls them disingenuous. I don't feel that these changes are particularly novel, uh, nor do I think that they have a, a tremendous impact on the behaviors that young people will exhibit with this technology. Most of them are opt-in technologies or opt-in aspects of the platform. Here's what teens say about teens. It's like they're going to do it if they want to do it. Like they're not going to really listen to a little notification that comes up and tells you to like get off. And perhaps as soon as Wednesday, we'll see what legislators make of the changes. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. When we come back, behind the work to create a plant-based vaccine to fight the coronavirus. And it's all happening in Canada. Manufacturing facilities have left, research facilities have left. We're reversing the trend. We'll take a closer look at what it could mean for science worldwide. Plus, we're actually liberating from this notion that people who need care have to give up a home. We visit a long-term care home that's doing things very differently. Welcome back. The pandemic gave Canada's biopharmaceutical industry a big kickstart, fueling the hunt for a homegrown vaccine. Today, big news from a Quebec City company that the phase three trials of its COVID vaccine show it to be highly effective. And as Christine Birak explains, not only could it soon get approval from Health Canada, this vaccine is also a global first. You're looking at seeds, the building blocks of what could soon be Canada's first homegrown COVID vaccine. If all goes to plan, it'll also be the world's first plant-based shot. Doses sucked from leaves could start rolling out within months, boosting the global supply of COVID-19 vaccines while injecting new life back into Canada's biopharmaceutical industry. Of course we're excited about the result. In a news release, Medicago, the Quebec-based company behind the vaccine, just announced positive phase 3 efficacy and safety results, saying its plant-based vaccine showed 75% efficacy against any symptoms from the Delta variant. That's higher than the estimated effectiveness against Delta offered by Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines, as seen in some studies. This is one of the germination chambers. Medicago's chief medical officer, Brian Ward, is eager to show off how far this small Canadian company has come. I think it's extraordinarily important. Over the last 20 years, Canada has actually seen a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies move out. Manufacturing facilities have left, research facilities have left. We're reversing the trend. From insulin to polio and the development of an Ebola vaccine, Canadian scientists have long been stepping up. The leadership matters, matters a hell of a lot. Mario Posamai is a forensic investigator who served as a senior advisor for the SARS Commission. He insists public health leaders ignored lessons from past crises and this pandemic revealed decades of neglect. I think we, we really need to look at, at vaccines and vaccine production as a strategic issue. We can't next time be cap in hand waiting for, you know, Ford manufacturer to produce it for us. The federal government is now racing to rebuild Canada's biopharmaceutical sector, including construction of a vaccine manufacturing plant in Montreal. Lakshmi Krishnan is the director general of the National Research Council. We hope that in due time, all of that will align and we will be able to produce vaccines in Canada. They are transferred here because they have more space. We have Isabel Caron is Medicago's director of manufacturing. She says with funding from the federal government, they've been able to scale up production. Unlike mRNA vaccines that offer our body a set of genetic instructions to make the spike protein, Medicago's vaccine offers those instructions to plants. Plant cells then grow virus-like particles covered in spike proteins, but don't contain the virus itself. When injected into the body, they show our immune system what to stick to and block out. Of course, it's a lot of work to get ready to manufacture a vaccine, but it's an exciting journey. The plant-based vaccine developed in this lab is truly novel. Other labs across the country are now busy too. In Ontario, they're working on a vaccine that can be inhaled. And in British Columbia, a company is now in human trials with an oral vaccine pill. 
So this will be an optimization uh, batch run. For it's us. early so days, but this oral vaccine research is also being sped up by federal funding. Alexander Graves is the CEO of Simvivo. He says a pill that delivers genetic material from the virus to our body would have countless advantages. So the way that we can envision this is that you could actually ship a vaccine directly to somebody's home for self-administration, as opposed to having to go and book a vaccine appointment at a clinic. Medicago is now getting ready to submit its data to Health Canada for final regulatory approval, hopefully building Canada's response to this pandemic while revitalizing the biopharmaceutical industry for the next one. Okay, so Christine, the, the technology for plant-based vaccines is super interesting, but why is it useful? What, what's the advantage here? Well, once this technology is established, there's incredible potential. The big difference is that many vaccines require these giant stainless steel bioreactors, and inside the temperature is carefully controlled to grow the key ingredients for their vaccines. And there's always this fear that another virus could get in and contaminate everything. In plant-based vaccines, there are no bioreactors. The greenhouses are what's growing the plants, which are growing the virus-like particles inside their own cells. So if this technology becomes established, this could be a really safe, stable supply of vaccines. And down the road, it would get much cheaper to produce. Okay, Christine Birak in Toronto, thank you. You're welcome. So interesting. After the devastating effect COVID had on those in long-term care in this country, we are looking elsewhere for solutions. This is not institutional. So we will take you to a nursing home in Ohio that could be a model for a better way. Welcome back. We all know that even before the pandemic, much of Canada's long-term care was in crisis. In Ontario alone, about 38,000 people are waiting for a spot in a nursing home. The province is about to embark on a massive project to build more facilities. But what should they be like? As David Common explains, we only need to look at Toledo, Ohio, to see the success of a nursing home that puts the emphasis on home. Okay, Mary, I'm going to do your hair, and then we're going to go get some breakfast. You hungry? Oh, yeah, I always hungry. Okay. It's mid-morning outside Toledo, Ohio, and Mary Nicodemus is just getting up. I like coffee. She loves her coffee. Okay, come on, let's go get something to eat. She's one of only 10 residents in this nursing home, which is redefining what these homes look like. Dina Webb is a caregiver here. Your spot. Oh, my. Like, I just think of some of the other long-term care facilities I've been in Canada, mm -hmm. and it's not like this. Everybody gets up like a conveyor belt at the same time. They get woken up, they get showered, they get dressed, and then get brought to, to dinner, and it's dozens of people. This is very different. Yes, um, I used to work in a facility like that. You have more time to spend with the elders, so it's not like traditional. Everybody got to get up at this time. Everybody got to lay down at that time because everybody is different. Mm -hmm. And it recognizes that. Mm -hmm. Another big difference, there isn't some mass kitchen cooking for hundreds, just Dina and another caregiver collaborating each week with the elders on a menu. Now with Mary, she's not picky with food. Some of them are, and we do make them accordingly what they like. For instance, Jenny don't like eggs, so we gave her waffles. But Mary, she will eat whatever you give her. With a smaller home, it also doesn't take long for staff to respond. When Mariah Jones's pager goes off, it's Jenny Eitner asking for help to get into her chair. Yes. Hi, Jenny. Hi. And unlike thousands of seniors in Ontario, Jenny doesn't share this room with anyone. I have my own room. I can do it any way I want it. And I have my own bathroom. I feel comfortable here. Most of the girls know who you are. And Dina knows what you like, what you don't like. Would that happen in a bigger long-term no. care home? No. What's the secret here? So we have fewer elders in a house. And our elder assistants, we have two that work in a house. They really get to know our elders. Tammy Allison is in charge here. Shirley, here's your water, Thank your you ice water. Much. But there are fewer managers than at other homes. The money focused instead on frontline care. The concept far less top down than many homes in Canada. 
you might find yourself involved in laundry or serving food or helping with food preparation or just sitting down and chatting with somebody. Done all of those this week already. So yeah, just wherever the need is. The outer assistants know they can call me and say, hey, I need some help. And you know, they can call any of our leadership team mm -hmm. and we'll be right there. I don't spend my day in an office. It really truly does feel like a family. We all just kind of jump in and work together. This concept of care called greenhouse model homes has had neighborhoods like this across the U.S. for 17 years, including this not-for-profit facility, which looks like a subdivision. It's run by Otterbein Senior Lifestyle Choices. Jill Wilson is the president and CEO. We call it the liberation at Otterbein. What are you liberating from? So we're actually liberating from this notion that people who need care and support and are older have to give up a home. But even Jill thought having fewer residents in smaller homes with just as many staff was unworkable at first. When her then boss told her to move entirely to this model, she pushed back. And he immediately turns red, right? He immediately turns red and he said, no, we're not going to talk about it. We're going to do it. Do you hear me? We're going to do this. Now you get your butt down to Tupelo, Mississippi and look at it and come back because you're going to do it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went down to Mississippi and I walked in to a house. And the first thing I said to myself, I mean, this most selfish thing I said, I could do this. If I needed to be in a nursing home, I could be here. She was convinced right away, but Jill also knew the concept couldn't cost radically more than other homes. So this isn't just a place for the wealthy. This is a place that is affordable. Yeah, well, most of the folks here uh, have, have no money. Yeah, and are um, on some sort of government yes, supported Yes, on, on Medicaid, on Medicaid. But is, is Medicaid paying way more than they would at an institution? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, no, absolutely not. And there is a difference in care. On average, Ontario seniors get fewer than three hours of direct care a day. In homes like this, it's almost double. But no matter how attentive the care, no home is perfect. Caring for people with complex health concerns is challenging. Even this one has had citations for deficiencies. And the fact remains that most hope to avoid spending the last years of their lives in a nursing home. The decision hard on families. Helen Anson, who's almost 90, lived with her daughter Sue McCluskey until about seven years ago, when it became too much. It's a big step when you put a loved one in a nursing home. It was tough to make this decision, but after I came in here and felt warm and invited, um, we knew that this was the right move for her. And Helen was reluctant too, no. but convinced <laughs> once she visited. This is not institutional. Institutional rules are different. And you could go to bed anytime you want to. And it was more homey, the table with people sitting there, chewing and chatting. Yeah. And that really caught my eye. Especially during COVID. With smaller homes, less turnover of staff, and only private rooms, Greenhouse had significantly fewer COVID cases and deaths compared to other American nursing homes. Did you have some comfort knowing that she was here? <laughs> Very comforted by that she was in a smaller facility that um, was following protocols very, very careful. Does this feel like home? Closest, yes. As Ontario now embarks on a massive effort to expand long-term care, homes like this show you don't have to follow the past, that this could be a model of the future. David Common, CBC News, Toledo, Ohio. Well, ahead of the Beijing Olympics, there's a new interest in winter sports in China. But to get really good at some of them, you've got to come to the experts. For me, his dream is my dream. The hockey family is moving from China to Canada to train right after this.
China's hockey team will be allowed to compete in the Olympics. The decision today from the International Ice Hockey Federation comes after months of concerns that the team didn't meet Olympic standards. China will be competing in the same group as several gold medal winners, including Canada and the United States. Now, with the games fast approaching, China has invested a lot of resources hoping to avoid complete embarrassment on home ice. The country doesn't have a hockey program of its own. But as Sasha Petrosik explains, with its eyes on the future, Beijing is working to develop some of its biggest hockey talents here in Canada. The sound of skates, the sharpening of skills on a Toronto rink. The scene is Canadian. The players here, all young Chinese. Along with their families, their teens who've moved halfway around the globe with the express goal of mastering hockey. Jason Zhou touched down and laced up in Canada at the age of nine. He's on a triple-A team with dreams of becoming the first Chinese national to play for an NHL team. People look at me, maybe they don't think I play hockey. Why? Because some of them don't even know that in China, we're starting to love hockey. His days are full of hockey training, the house where he moved with his mother, full of gym equipment. Even a basement room resembling a corner of the rink to practice shots. For me, yeah, I think his dream is my dream. So I, I like to uh, come here together with him. Hockey's just never been a big Chinese priority, despite the chance to shine on home ice at the Beijing Winter Games. Now, normally, that's the key in China, where the Olympics are never just about sport, but about a political pursuit to go for national glory. They'll likely fall short at the upcoming games, where China's hope is a squad patched together with Chinese and foreigners who play on this team based in Moscow. Mark Simons in Canada after more than a decade coaching in China. He says the answer is not to send the best young Chinese players overseas, but to build more of this there. When a system like this can properly be implemented in China, then in 15, 20 years, when kids start coming through that, then you'll have potentially a top 10, maybe even Olympic team. For now, though, Beijing's Kaylin Chen plays in Toronto for the St. Michael's Buzzers, hoping for a day the Chinese anthem echoes through a hockey arena at the Olympic level. Every time you hear it, I, I feel proud of it. You know, like our own country playing a sport we love so much. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, a long-awaited moment and a surprise celebration. I'm very happy. I am very happy today. Am very happy. After his citizenship was delayed by COVID, an Ontario teacher makes sure her colleague's big moment gets the celebration it deserves. Next. After years of waiting, Julio Para is officially a Canadian citizen. He's a caretaker at an Ontario elementary school, and today he got a big surprise. So staff and students all rallied in red and white, Thanks to the kindness of one of the teachers, and that celebration is our moment. Congratulations! Yes, it was a big surprise today. I come from to Canada 30 years ago. Now I am very happy to receive the citizenship. Today is a very special day for me. Mr. Parra had mentioned to me in the hallway that um, Tuesday, today was his very special day and that he would be getting his citizenship. And so as a staff, we all knew he's been with us since our school opened. We knew we had to do something to celebrate this momentous occasion. But we wanted to capture the moment of Mr. Parra coming into the school for the first time. The students wore red and white today and we made a banner to welcome him in. Oh. He's been uh, someone that is a bit of a, a rock for our schools. And he's been here for so long that he's watched a lot of these kids grow up. So it's really special. My life is Canada, the school. Now it's, it's, it's very happy. I am very happy today. Oh, 
I love that. The good news always welcome. And, and you know, the look of that, very Canadian, and the sound of it, too, with the anthem, the spirit of it. But also, they, they gave him a little basket of Canadiana, some Canadian paintings and cards, and, and maple syrup. Of course, of course. <laughs> so he is the uh, last of his family to get the citizenship. He wanted to make sure everyone else had it. And then when it was his turn, he got it. So congratulations, sir. That is the National for December the 7th. Good night. Good night.